Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Donna Peterson, uh, Peterson and I'm going to be your moderator tonight. This uh, forum is put on by the Payette uh, Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to introduce the Chamber members at this time. We have Liz, Young, or Liz Long, who's our president. We have Marcy Grant. Stephen Cook, who's our timekeeper tonight. Amanda Thompson. And Wayne Wickleshan. <laughs> Um, some ground rules. We would ask that you be respectful tonight and no outbursts. Um, these people have used, sent their time to come and visit with you. If you have any questions, I would ask that you give them to Amanda. We'd like to review questions just to make sure that there's nothing derogatory on a question that puts somebody out. So if you could do that, we, we would appreciate it. Yeah. Um, we have cards for you. Um, the speakers will have one minute to introduce themselves, and then they will have two minutes for questions. Is there any questions in the audience about how it's going to go? Okay, let's begin. So, let's start. Doug, got one minute. All righty. Didn't know I was going to be on it. Hello? Oh yeah, it's on. Okay, I'm Doug Henderson. Um, I have lived here since 1976. I graduated in 1980. I served full-time in the Air National Guard from 83 to 89. Um, after leaving the Air National Guard, I continued a career in information technology. Actually, my first job here was for it. And over the course of my career, I've been a local, regional, and a national IT director. Um, in 1996, I joined the Payette Fire Department. April 17, 2003, I had a life-altering accident that I nearly lost my life and my right arm. And if you want to talk to me more about that later, I can tell you how that changed my life. Um, later that year, I ran and was voted out <coughs> the Payette City Council. And in 2005, I ran for and won the mayor of the city of Payette. Okay, your time is up. Oh, <laughs> I'll tell you about the rest of me later. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Daniel Lopez. I am currently a city councilor for you guys, representing you on, on the city council. Um, we have multiple businesses. We're entrepreneurs here in the city, as well as uh, the city of Weezer. Uh, we want to continue to be doing good things uh, for our community and moving forward and building better infrastructure and just uh, building a better community together. I don't need a full minute. Hi. Hi everyone, I'm Lori Steinecker and I'm also currently on the council. I have been here my whole life and I'm also the director of special ed for the district. I started teaching in 95 here at the district and I just, I love this town and I love serving the community and working to make it a better place for our current and our future generations. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Mike Key. I'm currently on the council. I was appointed uh, about six years ago and then ran four years ago. I uh, worked as a police officer in, since 81 through, oh, I don't know, 30 years. Uh, left that and managed the city for about six more years. And I'm retired now. My wife and I have lived in Payette for uh, about 12 years. Our mayor is here. Mayor Jensen, would you stand I'm up? here. Okay. <laughs> we, started, we started without you. Uh, we had um, three questions submitted online. The first one is, and I'll just start down the line and we'll give you two minutes. Craig, or uh, Doug, what do you see as the chamber's role within the city of Payette? Hello? Yeah, it's on. Um, I see the Chamber's goal as promoting the City of Payette. It's not, they're not the sole promoters of the City of Payette, but their job is to promote the City of Payette, help communicate with the businesses, let the Council know, the Mayor know, the public know what they need and what they want to excel and survive in the City of Payette. Um, and that's what I would say is the Chamber's done. And I did it within the conference. You did. Daniel. So I was on the chamber board, board for a while, and it's kind of hard. 
in today's day and age to see what, what the chamber's job is. With social media and, and uh, free access to advertising, a chamber is kind of hard to mold in today's day and age. You know, you go back to 30 years ago where you didn't have all this stuff in your pocket. Um, you needed a chamber to get your name out there as a business. Um, so today I think the chamber's job is, when it comes to political facets, is the chamber needs to be looking at how the city can do better to allow businesses to come into our city, make it easier, make it less costly, um, but still keep the regulation in there to where it's safe and an honest work. Um, that's where I see the chamber's role is today. Um, so my, my dad was the president of the chamber years and years ago when we had the gold Christmas trees down Main Street. And, and I just see from his role and everything that the chamber is to help promote business and to work with the city to say, hey, this business wants to come in. And so what can we do to work together to invite them to come in and then to get all of the businesses to work together to have fun things like the costume contest and, and the park at Halloween and different things like that. So I see it as a cooperative between the chamber and the city that we're both working together to improve our city. Uh, I think the chamber's, I think the chamber's number one job would be to advocate for businesses that are existing in the city, keep those businesses here, uh, keep them as happy as we can. Uh, the city shares that responsibility uh, with the council and the city can actually mess it up a lot uh, worse than the council could. Uh, I really like the uh, uh, events that the chamber brings to town and heads up and runs. I know how hard that is uh, for a small group to do that and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is what is your vision for our small town to look like in the next five to ten years? And how will, you, how will your goals impact the quality of life for your constituents? I'm sorry, once again. Okay, how, what is your vision of our small town to look like in the next five to ten years? And how will your goals impact the quality of life for those who live in Fayette? I'm sitting on the wrong end of the table. <laughs> Um, I, my goal for the city of Payette is to make it a city that businesses thrive in, that serves the needs of the community, that makes others, right now we seem to all flow to Ontario and all flow to Fruitland. I would like to get the city to a point where Fruitland, Ontario and Weezer flows to us and helps our businesses out. Um, the root of what I want to do is, you know, I, I live in a perfect situation right now. I have a son and a daughter that live in Payette and seven grandchildren that live in Payette. And what I'm, what my goal is, is to make those children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and your children, great-children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren want to live in this town. Ten years from now, I'd like to see the city, city of Payette have a lot of industry and commercial business. Um, that's my goal. So to get that goal, we have to have sustainable growth, and I've said that since day one, sustainable and attainable growth. Um, and the way we do that is by working with developers, bringing in new developments, and uh, it's always a give and take. And, and as long as the city's not a loser and the, our, my constituents aren't a loser, that's what we got to do. We've got to grow sustainably and steady growth. We can't have booms, we can't have, you know, dry spells. It just needs to be sustainable growth from here on. And hopefully we can conserve some ag through that growth. But that's that's just one of my things. I want to see the flylands stay ag and I want to grow to the hills ultimately where where the ag is less. Uh, my vision, and I'm on a committee right now where we're trying to get grant money, and so we're working to develop a historical walking uh, tour of downtown Payette that will expand and go towards the Chase House and everything. So 
our community is able to get out and do things that are family friendly, that get them outside, that everybody has access to. And I agree with Daniel, we need to have sustainable growth. And I also want to work with our schools and I mean, Payette's an amazing place to live, but we get bad-mouthed all the time. And we're a jewel just waiting to be uncovered. And so my vision is that in 10 years from now, people are saying, oh, I want to move to Payette because look at how beautiful the streets are and look at all of the little shops they have downtown and look at all of the opportunities they have for family to go out and do things together because I'm raising my almost five-year-old grandson, so I want to make this a place that will be enjoyable for him to be in living at when he's 56 years old. So that's my vision for Payette. I always think of what's it going to be like in the next 20 years? What is my decision today? How is it going to affect the community 20 years down the line, 20, 30 years down the line? And so everything I do, I look at that as how are we going to make our city be the jewel that it really is? So one of the things that worries me uh, in Payette is we've got 100-year-old utilities under the ground. And they've been somewhat overlooked uh, for the past, yeah, for some time. And so we, we have developed a plan uh, where, and a list of priorities where we're going in and we're fixing all this underground utility. And so my vision would be that we, uh, you know, keep this place working uh, for the next 30 years. I really, I also really like what Doug said. It's hard to keep kids here in the local area, you know, and I grew up in across the river and it was hard to keep our kids there, uh, you know, just a lack of employment, things to do. Um, so it would be really important for me to get to a point, uh, have some business, industry, uh, IT, you can do IT from anywhere, even pay at Idaho. Uh, and keep those kids here and, uh, you know, just make it a great place to live. I would, I also want to add, uh, my vision is also to keep the uh, liberal, uh, the liberal garbage around our state out of our state. The VFW presented plans for their building, but the city kept asking for changes. Why does the city not want to support the VFW? I think, Dan I think it's Daniel's turn to go. <laughs> Don, we can't hear you. Okay. We'll get you I'll take that question. Yeah, would you please? Because honestly, I don't know the answer to this because we don't get all of the information from the city. We hear, we hear what we're allowed to hear unless we go in and ask all the questions. And so we did hear, well, it wasn't doing this and it wasn't doing that. So I don't know. And I'm just going to have to say that. Can Donna repeat the question? Yes. yes. I'm sorry, again. The VFW presented plans for their building, but the city kept sell or asking for more changes. Why does the city not support the VFW? So I don't, I don't believe it's the city not supporting the VFW. Um, you know, I, I sat down with Al as a contractor many times, and, and we, we, we talked about it, which is the, the commander of the VFW. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, the VFW had an issue where, where they wanted to build a structure, and they didn't know what they were going to put inside it. And with our current building standards, and, and this is the thing about safety, you have to know what a building is going to be used for, how they're going to build out the inside, before you can say, yeah, put that structure up. Because what happens is people build a structure, and then behind closed doors, they're able to do whatever they want. 
And it's not necessarily going to be safe because the, city's, the city building inspector isn't involved in the whole process. And as a contractor, there's a lot of things that can be done wrong that can cause a safety hazard. So the BMW's issue was they didn't want to solidify their plan for the inside of their building, and the city was holding, holding true to its job and saying, hey, we have to have a full plan of how we're going to use this building. Where, how many bathrooms it's going to have? Is it going to have a kitchen? Is it going to have a bar? Is it going to have all this stuff? And I think there was some breakdown of communication between the two entities, the VFW and the, and the city, and we can definitely do better as a city when it comes to communicating. We've come a long ways in four years, I believe. I believe we're a lot more transparent, and, uh, and you go in there and you actually get an answer. You know, when I first came home in 15 from the Navy, I couldn't get a straight answer, and, uh, and we've come a long ways from those days. So we still have some work to do in that, and, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a citizen, I'd love to patronize the VFW and, and have them in here, but uh, they just couldn't get it together. And the city, the city wasn't the most helpful in that situation either. So, Mike, do you have anything else to add to that? Well, I, I had been asked that question before, and, and so I investigated it a little bit. And they, they wanted to put a, put a commercial kitchen in there. Well, commercial kitchen is about the hardest thing uh, to do uh, because of, the, because of the, the fire risk and the safety that the commercial kitchen, because, you know, they're inviting other people. This isn't like building a house. They're inviting sometimes paid uh, customers to come into the VFW, or at least uh, customers. And so it's important that uh, all the fire safety aspects of a commercial kitchen be adhered to. Well, let me tell you, that costs a lot of money uh, to build a commercial kitchen with all the ventilation and the fans and the fire suppression. And so I know they and the city were having that discussion. I never got personally involved in it, except that I had been asked the question a couple times, and that's what I was told at the city. Thank you. Thank you. Like Lori said, I don't know a lot about this, even though I've heard a lot about this. Um, and what that means is I've heard many comments and rumors on this. And the, the best way to stop rumors and comments and bad things said about the city is with truth. Um, I think we do a poor job of getting information out there. Um, that's one of the things, it's written right here on my paper if you don't believe me, one of the things that I was going to talk about that I want to focus on. I, I, I don't, most people can understand things if it's explained to them. They may not agree with it, but they respect the fact that you explain that to them. Um, I want to open those doors. I'm going to start doing it personally, and I hope we do it more as a council and more as a city. Um, I'll start here. Um, I don't. Is there anything from the newspaper here? Because you can publish this when I say this. But 208-740-3888. That's my number. I've told everyone I see that. If you want information about what's going on in the city, if I get on the council. Call that number. I'll talk to you. I'm going to start a text group where I can send out information to everyone in this group before the meetings start that tells people what we're going to be talking about, what the agenda is. And yes, I know we post the agenda in places, but most people, the only place they see that is when they're dropping off their water bill and half of us are in the dark when we do that. And we don't really pay attention to it. But I think we'll be a lot better city if people know what's going on. Um, my plan, like I said, I'm going to do a text group where I can inform people about what happens before, what happened after the meeting. I'm going to set up a Facebook page because a lot of us... Oh, sorry. I'm having a problem staying within the time. So I have one uh, last question that was submitted uh, online. It says, the section of 7th Avenue North from Shelley Street to Iowa is dangerous and should be an embarrassment to the city. Why, why should, was it not completed to Iowa before two housing developments were approved? And do you propose to fix it? And if so, who's going to pay for it? Daniel, we'll start with you. Shelley Street to Iowa, or Shelley, Shelley, Shelley Iowa, 7th Avenue North. 
Kelly Street. Yeah. Um, I've driven that road a lot. Uh, it's a lot better than it was. Uh, so there's a, there's an issue there. Um, there's private property that, that that is adjacent to that road that we couldn't strike a deal with the property owner to get the easement to widen the road. So you can either widen the road on one side and the other, which is on the east side, it is widened. Um, but we couldn't get the property from him at a reasonable value. And when people want to charge you too much money for land, I mean, it wasn't market value. Um, do we really spend the taxpayer money that way? I don't believe so. So when it came down to it, uh, there was no reason to push the issue when, when we weren't going to take somebody's land. We, we, I, I believe in personal property rights. I'm not going to take somebody's land away from them. Um, hopefully one day we can strike a deal with that homeowner and, and, and get that expanded. Is it going to happen in the next four years? I can tell you it took three years of me being on the council to finally get a, get a fix for River Street. So, so it might. Um, it is high on the agenda. Uh, I know there's been an accident out there. And, uh, and you know, people just have to slow down and go 25 miles an hour and be safe. Um, if you're not driving safe, there's a possibility for accidents. And that road needs to be improved, and hopefully in the next four years we can. And, and ultimately, the, ta the taxpayers are going to have to pay for it. The developer paid for all that he, he was obligated to per ordinance. And, uh, yeah, that's the way it sits with me. Another issue about that road is that the south side is county, and we looked into annexing it, and it's not possible to annex it with the current laws in place. And so, yeah, when when the developer came in, we're like, yes, we need this up to code. And like Daniel was saying, there's a section there that he would not sell it for a decent price. He wanted like four times the market price. We're not going to spend your money on, you know, in that way because that's not fiscally responsible and so it is an issue i i remember was it last year there was you left iowa and you drove five feet and there was a 25 mile an hour speed limit sign and then you drove another five feet and it was a 35 mile an hour speed limit sign because the county had one speed limit sign and we had one speed limit sign I'm like guys we got to work together on this and so that's what we need to do is we all need to work together we need to work together with the county and we need to figure out an answer for that road because not only is it dangerous for the cars that are driving, and they're developing a lot of houses out there, there are a lot of school kids that live out there now who need a safe walk to school. Safe route to school so they can walk from Shelley and that subdivision there, the subdivisions, to McCain, and in the dark, not get hit. And so it's something that's also on my agenda to improve in the next four or so years that you would be real to me. Uh, I drive that uh, sometimes four or five times a day. The, the, the frontage in front of the private uh, residence really isn't an issue. The only thing that didn't allow us to do was put a bike lane and a sidewalk in. The, the lane width is the same as, the, as all the other improved roads. Uh, but the problem is the uh, county side of it is uh, <coughs> terrible. There's really no shoulder. There's potholes where there is a shoulder. And then between where the developer uh, stopped developing to Iowa, it's a very narrow uh, two-lane road with drop-offs on, on each side. <coughs> the, I mean, there... It, it would be it wouldn't be good use of resources for the city to uh, build build that road for the county. Uh, it just I I think we would be taken out and hung from the gallows if we did that. So it just doesn't make sense. And oftentimes, what happens as it did up around Shelley, as property develops uh, because of the the standards that the city has, developers are required to. Uh, improve the roads and that's how what road has been improved up there is that's why it's been improved thank you okay um, I don't I don't know that much
much about that particular situation. I know about the, the landowner that didn't want to sell the property. Um, we had the same embarrassment when I was mayor. The, um, and someone here mentioned that, I believe Daniel did. River Street, that's been, we, we tried for years to get that done. And you're dealing with a limited budget and unexpected expenses, and it makes it hard sometimes to get things done that you really want done. But that goes back to what I was saying before. We need to do a better job of communicating with the public so the public understands why these things have happened. Like I said, they may not agree with them, but they'll respect the fact that we try to explain to them why these things happen. And I just think that's important. And this time I'm not going to let her say I'm over time. <laughs> All right, this one's for you, Mike. Okay. If you could, if you could be king for a day, right. what's one thing you would change in the city code, and why? Oh gosh, <laughs> there's so many. Well, you gotta pick one. <laughs> Good lord! In the city code. Let's well, make it the zoning code. Would that make narrow it down? So no, that'd be oh. that'd be even worse. <laughs> Uh, I guess if I was king for a day, and I'm saying this only because we've had recent problems with it, when a, when a city gets to a certain size, and I think the size is 10,000, they have to take the water that they gather in all those storm drains that right now just runs directly into a stream. And when we reach 10,000, we have to start treating that water like we do wastewater. That's going to be very expensive. I understand why we have to do that. Uh, I don't necessarily agree. And right now, we're a ways from 10,000. And we've had several developers who, who have wanted to develop a piece of property. And our standards are such that they haven't been able to because to develop a, a right now we require somebody that develops property to keep all that stormwater on their property. They can't send it out to the street going down a storm drain. They have to build a swale or some kind of drainage and keep it on their property. You gotta get an engineer. And the engineer's got to figure how much or how long and, you know, it takes for this water to seep in and stay on the property. And we've killed a couple projects. So right now, if I uh, had to change one thing, I would make that easier and still try to accomplish, uh, you know, keeping that or that greasy water out of the, directly out of the river or stream. Um, I agree with Mike. That is one of our biggest issues right now because we have had to kill a couple of, of projects that would have been good for the city because building a drain, as Daniel can attest, is expensive. So that would be one thing. I would also like to look at our sidewalk code because our sidewalks need help and We've started a sidewalk fund that people can apply for to get some help with reimbursement once they re, um, refinish their sidewalks and redo them. But we, I just, we need a better way to help citizens keep their sidewalks decent, and and we need to fix the ADA access on all of the curbs. So I would want to look at our sidewalk code. I think. Daniel, you're not a king. I didn't think I was going to be a king when you posed that question. Well, you didn't want to be a queen. <laughs> I mean, mine would be a zoning code. I would, I would uh, reduce the uh, minimum size for single family home, lot size to 4,500 square feet. Um, right now, we have an issue where our, our minimum building lot is 6,000 square feet, and what that does is it increases the cost of, of housing substantially. Um, you put a 1,100 square foot house on a 6,000 square foot lot, and uh, you got a big yard, and and if we uh, if we were to drop that down to 4,500, you'd have a great, a great yard and affordable 1,100 square foot house. You know, we've come to this to this day and age that every everybody wants a 1,500 square foot house. 40 years ago, the average house was 800 square feet, and 
a 1,500-square-foot house is, is not attainable to a 25-year-old couple. And one way we can fix that is by changing that zoning law and going down to 4,500 square feet because the dirt is expensive. And that's how I would fix that. I agree with Lori. The sidewalk is a mess, but I won't fit that inside my two minutes. Um, I think, and I don't want them to tell me the code's been changed recently because I could be wrong, but for you to do an improvement on your home to get a building permit, you have to be under, I believe it's 299 square feet, or is it 199? 200 square feet, you don't have to get a building permit. Right, under 200 square feet, you don't have to get a building permit. I think that should be increased. I think that there's a lot of us that would like to improve our homes, and I think improving our homes is good for the city, and I don't think you necessarily need to get a building permit to improve your home if you're improving it below probably 400 square feet. That's just my personal opinion. That probably contradicts what Daniel said because he was talking about having an 800 square foot house. Okay, I'm all for less regulation. All right. Okay. All right. So, Doug, you got the microphone. You can be next. Okay. Okay. I thought there were three questions. Okay. How do you plan to involve residents in the decision making process in our community if you become <coughs> on the city council? I think I've tried to say that a whole bunch, and you wouldn't let me get in because there was two minutes involved. Two minutes, yeah. Okay, like I said, um, I think that's one of the most important things we can do is share information with the public, make the public understand why we do things, why we don't do things, and hear from them what they think we ought to do. Um, people ask me, why, uh, what are you going to do if you get elected to council? And my answer to most of them has been, the best answer to that is, what do you want me to do if I get elected to the council? Um, I think that the problem with our politicians today is too many of them forget the people once they get elected. Um, I think that we really need to open the lines of communication, keep that flow going, and I, like I said, I gave the phone number, I'll give anybody the phone number that wants this, you can call me personally, I'll have coffee with you, I'll do whatever. We're going to set up a Facebook page. This is all if I get elected. And make sure, you know, the younger people, that's the way they're going to communicate with you. And I just want to make overall, make, a, make the communication between the city and the public more thorough. And like I said, rumors are caused because people don't have the correct information. Did you steal my notebook? Yes. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm pretty approachable. I, I've never put myself on a pedestal. If anybody wants to talk to me about current issues in the city, I always always stand and listen and, and give my feedback if, if it's warranted. Um, I, uh, I am a re representative of the citizens of Payette. I am not a leader of the citizens of Payette. I am a representative. Um, and if you elect me, I will continue to be a representative. Uh, before, you could find me in the store all the time, but now uh, I'm not there as often. I'm concentrating on the construction business, but uh, but you catch me on the street, grab me. Um, you want my phone number? I don't know if I want to put it on Facebook, but uh, you guys can come find me and grab it. And, uh, and yeah, just, that's just for telemarketers. I, I get enough yeah, extended warranties. Um, but yeah, that's it. I mean, I try to communicate with people on a daily basis when we're out and about in town and talk to people. And, and my wife will tell you that sometimes I talk too much. Um, so I do have a Facebook page. We were um, told that we should not have Facebook pages, but I've had one since I ran for election four years ago, and I post the agenda to it every single time. We've had public hearings, and so I'm like, hey, there's a public hearing about this well, increase to our garbage rate, but the Hardens wanted 8%. I'm like, we're having a public hearing on this. Please let me know your input. And so if people do contact me, um, my number is right there on the city's web page, so you can call or text me. I won't answer your number if I don't recognize it, because it could be someone wanting insurance for my car. But um, I, I'm very approachable, and I have, you know, I was taking my dog for a walk down the street one day, and I had three neighbors come out and say, hey, it stinks here. And so I called the mayor right there, and I'm like, hey, what can you do? And so um, I am 
I am a representative of the citizens. I am not up here for what's best for Lori. I am up here for what is best for you. And there's some times where I vote no, or Danny votes no, or Mike votes no, because we don't think we should vote yes based on what people have told us. And so um, I also, I know we Zoom our meetings, but the microphones, it, it, we need better technology so that people can be at home and Zoom in and watch our meetings and just improve things, open communication. Uh, well, we have we have improved our technology in in City Hall. Uh, when I first uh, became involved with the council, I would get comments from people who tried to watch it online, and it was just gobbledygook. They couldn't couldn't understand anything. Sometimes they couldn't see anything, and uh, so we really pushed uh, to put money in the budget to improve that, and. Uh, Thanks to a local contractor, uh, he came in and really made some improvements so you can actually hear what's going on in the city council meeting in the comfort of your own home if you don't want to come to a city, to city hall. Um, when Mayor Jensen was elected, uh, you know, we, we all sat down and talked to him. One of the things that I had mentioned to him was to, uh, that I was interested in, in more town halls. Well, he was already, he was already all over that. And uh, he thinks uh, town halls are a great benefit to invite people down, uh, listen to their concerns. And uh, so we've done, geez, I don't know, we've done a lot more uh, public or town hall meetings, informal, uh, than we did in the, you know, uh, two or three years that I was involved prior. I also, uh, when, I'm, when I'm on council, uh, when I make a decision, especially if it's a, a decision that goes against uh, what somebody would like, I always take the, the time to explain why I did that. Sometimes the other counselors make fun of me for doing that, but I think it's important that if I'm going to vote no, or adversely, if I'm going to vote yes for something, I need to explain why I did it. Thank you. I put on it too. I want to say when I said that politicians forget about the people who elected them, I wasn't referring to anybody at this table. Some people in our community say that there's a traffic problem, especially on Highway 95. <laughs> and we know it's an IDT road. But what would you do, or do you think there's a problem? And what would you do to mitigate those pro those concerns? I know that at the stoplight, we've I've seen traffic backed all the way to the dollar store and past the high school. So, what do you think, Daniel? You're looking like at me, so. <laughs> can I can I go first? Oh, okay. So I was actually on a committee with the ITD department, and when you are at. 2nd Avenue South or 7th, you are now able to turn right if you're going north. So that was one change we did to help increase traffic flow so you didn't have to just wait. Because we were all turning right anyway, we were just squeezing in there. Now there's an actual lane to turn right. Another thing we did was we worked with them to, um, with the timing of the lights, to try to change the timing so you could have a better flow. Now. Since we've done that, I think we need to go back and look at it again because the traffic is horrendous and the flow and it gets backed up. But it's this is going to be a long-term fix because what we need is to expand it to four lanes. And that's going to be a lot of working with ITD and there's a lot of property along that, that section that's going to have to be bought out. So it's a long-term fix that's not going to be able to be solved overnight. But I do think we've taken some good steps to help start that process, and I more than I would love to make more progress on it too, because I'm one of those that I have to go down and turn right to be able to go left. So it is big. So, Lauren, can I ask you an additional question since you were on the IT committee? Is, and this is the personal one, but in the middle of the night, if you want to, if you hit that stop sign, if there's nobody around on 7th Avenue North. There's nobody around, uh -huh. and the light stays red for 10 minutes. Is there a chance that those lights can go blinking after a certain time? 
time, or is it that because of the fire station? I don't know that answer, but I do think you can turn but left I want to go left at that time. Yeah, but if I wanted, if I was coming up Seventh Avenue and I wanted to cross oh. 95. I will look into that. Okay, because I, I felt some promise. concerns. That was one of the things they asked us. How come we have to sit at this light at midnight when there's no traffic? But the minute I go through, there'll be a cop there. Right? <laughs> yep. Why are you out at midnight, Donna? I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't yeah. know that. Either. I will look into that. <laughs> Daniel, I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, you're fine. Um, the one thing that I don't want to see is another bypass. Um, uh, the last thing we want to do is bypass 95 again. Um, so, unfortunately, because previously some decisions were made, the properties were built right against the highway, which was terrible decision making back then, in my opinion. Um, it's going to be hard to widen 95. I think the fix that, that the mayor and Lori uh, worked worked out, and Mike, Mike, you remember with me, um, with ITB was a good fix. Uh, it's not great. Uh, those lines get eaten up real fast because people go kind of are used to driving the old traffic pattern. Um, eventually, everybody's gonna gonna get used to it. Um, but the one thing that we can do for for our citizens in the city of Payette is we can fix collector streets. Um, we can get better better collector streets to go east and west. Um, if we if you were coming into town and you were going to stay in the city of Payette to keep you off the of 95, and you took the spur because you had a nice road that you can get all the way up up the hill, uh, you'd probably start making that traffic pattern over sitting in traffic at five o'clock on Highway 95. Because we're not going to ease up the traffic going north, and and to buy up that much property uh, to to expand Highway 95 in town is, is going to be a lot, and, and it's going to take the state to want to invest in the city of Payette that much, and and I don't see it happening anytime soon. But maybe if we get more industry, we have more trucks going up and down the highway um, to Payette, we can justify it to them, and we can be at the table and say, hey, we need this, and and we need it now. I agree this is a big problem. It's a problem we dealt with 17 years, 19 years ago while I was mayor. Um, I gotta really emphasize something that Daniel said. I sat in some ITE meetings back when we got the first light in town and that word was brought up, bypass. Um, if, if that is ever proposed by the ITD, everyone here, everyone you know, should be in the next ITD meeting stomping their feet and screaming because bypasses have killed so many towns in the state of Idaho. It, 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 that is the worst case scenario of fixing this problem. Um, and also, you people need to call ITD and complain about it. You know, the people studying here and the people on the council, the people of the city have limited control over the highway the state highway that comes through our city. <clears throat> the more they hear from you, the more chance there is that they will do something about it. Um, it's especially with the state, I dealt with them a lot when I was mayor. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. I know it's an old term, but that's the truth. Everyone should call about this. Everyone should tell everyone they know to call about this because the state is the ultimate one that needs to and will fix this, but we'd like it done in our lifetimes. Mike, did you No, I didn't. <laughs> did you want to? <laughs> uh, I was, oh, the mayor asked me to be on the committee with Lori also, and uh, we not only, and ITD was very, uh, I mean, ITD was great. I'm, I, I'm the first to criticize state agencies, but they are, uh, they were, so, they would sit down and listen to us for hours, and we'd talk about the traffic. And so we finally, we came up with these two turn lanes, one at seventh and one at the highway. And, and like, I, like Lori said, uh, their technician came over and tinkered with the, they could do anything with those lights as far as timing. Uh, so we tinkered with those, and um, you know, for I waited, waited, waited for them to paint those turn lanes because, like, uh, you know, traffic was it was backing up clear to to Dutch Bros. 
And so they finally painted the turn lanes, and for like a week, I'm driving through there, and there's no traffic. I see trucks turning, using the turn lane and turning onto the highway, and it's just wonderful. And, and uh, I talked to a couple citizens who complained about the traffic, and I said, we fixed it. You know, we put these two turn lanes in, and we tinkered with the lights, and I was coming home from uh, somewhere at 5 o'clock the next day, and the traffic was backed up, cleared to Dutch Bros. And so that, that was disappointing. We'll just continue to work on it. Uh, they know there's a problem. We're on a list. Uh, there's limited funding at the state level also. We also talked about uh, a through road from somewhere in the area of Dutch Bros that just goes directly up to Highway 52 to keep that traffic out of that uh, space there. So we'll keep working on it. Thank you. I have a question from the audience. Railroad Lane is becoming a car yard. What can the city do about that? I didn't hear that. It says that Railroad Lane is becoming a car yard. What can the city do about that? The railroad car. Oh. Are, you know how you have um, a junction where you have a railroad junction they where they, you know, they hook in, they change switch lanes, they do all of this stuff. Since we've lived here since 2019, we bought, we're actually in the county, but we butt up against, you know, the city. And you guys don't talk to each other, I'm just saying. <laughs> But that's not me. But for us, I got no problem with the railroad. My husband loves the railroad. I'm a graphic designer, so I love the art of all kinds. But when you have them disconnect, and you'll have, I don't know, six, sometimes three times, sometimes it goes all the way down to the point if you're familiar with it. And then, They'll Can't be there this. like for one day, two days, or maybe they'll be there for a couple hours. We never know. But it's becoming a car yard intersection rather than a traveling through. The other thing is that their speed is absolutely way out of this world. We <coughs> um, I put up a six foot fence. That helps me. <coughs> but like today we have, um, there was probably nine cars there. They've been there for a couple hours and some kids got into between the two cars and were drilling something on them. Okay, that's dangerous. Okay. I'm Whatever sure. they were doing, who knows? And unfortunately that's illegal. Uh, yeah, they're, 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 no, well, for, well, unfortunately for those kids, it's, it is illegal. Um, you know, the railroad is, is pretty much autonomous when, when it comes to the railroad. The railroad, railroad can do whatever they want. And we have to, I mean, the reason there's a bump on 7th Avenue North is because the railroad raised the lot, the, that track, and uh, they don't have to fix it. That's what they told us. They don't have to. They did. They went and fixed it a little bit, made it a little bit better. Yeah, um, people across there, I believe it. But, uh, but when it comes to the railroad, I mean, we are a, what are we? What are we? We're considered a, a rail hub of some sort, right? Well, I didn't think we were. That was my question. Yeah, we are, we are a rail, I believe we're a rail hub. Plus, we have the, the onion sheds down there that they use rail cars to, to send onions out of, the, out of this valley and all over the United States. And Seneca uses the rail cars too. So that's where, that's where they're moving rail, where rail cars in and out. Um, and those are, I mean, big industry for us in this, in, in this town at this time. So we need the railroad, um, and uh, all we can do is continue to foster that relationship with them and, and ask them to ask them in our nicest voice to say, "Hey, can you do a little better?" I just wondered if there was a way to communicate this. Yeah, I know the mayor talks to the railroad quite a bit. Um, us as a council, we don't necessarily deal with the railroad. We we push all of our all of our complaints to the mayor, and he, he he's done a good job of talking to him. Oh, is that him down there? Yeah, that, that guy right there. So you catch him after the after the meeting and. Uh, Last spring, the railroad sent some big wigs up, and so the mayor and several council members, uh, the school, the police, the city, 
uh, street department, we all met down there at 7th Avenue and we had a talk about what can we do to improve these junctions and make it safer for our school buses and for citizens to get across. And so it is something, working with the railroad is something that the mayor is, is doing a great job on. So he looks like Bono right now, but you can talk to him. <laughs> This is definitely a catch-22, because like Daniel referred to, the onion sheds in Seneca, that's how they survive. That's, you know, Seneca has a building that the railroad backs right into, a huge warehouse over there. Um, so the car setting in that section is necessary for business. Um, actually, my family's done something to help 7th Avenue North, the railroad crossing there. My wife got hit there, and the next day is when they put the arms down that are there, but that's a whole other story. Um, but yes, it, the railroad is a concern, but it's also a necessary evil, so to speak, and I don't really mean it's really evil, but it, if we want expanded industry and expanded tax base, the things you're referring to are gonna happen, but it doesn't hurt to tell the railroad, let's see if we can be more safe about it and be less of a delay to our lives about it. No. I have nothing to add. So each one of you come from different backgrounds and different experiences. How do you see yourself managing the competing interests within the city council? Well, I love that we have I love that we have uh, competing interests uh, because of our individual experiences. I love having uh, uh, the discussions that we have during a council. I uh, value, you may not believe this, but I value everybody on that council's opinion. Uh, many times, and I'm stubborn, but many times my a fellow counselor has made an, uh, an argument about something and it's made me change my mind. And I think I've, I think I've been able to do that uh, with some of the other counselors. I just love uh, having the discussion. Uh, any, as anybody that's been to a city council meeting can tell you, sometimes they drag on way, 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 way too long. Uh, because of the discussions that we have, but uh, you know, hopefully, we'll come out the end uh, with a better decision. <clears throat> I, before I uh, got out of this current council, I didn't know Daniel Lopez. I sit next to him, uh, and we have some great conversations. And oftentimes, we uh, disagree. I just think, boy, that Daniel, that is so wrong. Gee, Merry Christmas! And uh, but we have these, we have these great, great discussions. I really respect, uh, you know, what the other counselors think, and it's always civil. Would you say, Mayor? I think so. I think we're always civil, and uh, you know, at the end, we usually come out with some kind of decision. As you know, I was on the council before, so I had to deal with this, and I was mayor and I had to deal with it, and the, the communication between the council is why we have six councilors. We want varying opinions, and I, when I've been going through this last few weeks and I've been politicking, people ask me what I thought of the other councilors, and I have a good opinion on all of them. I think they can all do a great job, but there was comments about Daniel a lot, <laughs> We're picking on Daniel right now, but the comment was usually that he questions everything. And I said, that's what I like about Daniel. He questions everything. And that's what makes the council a healthy place, is, you know, just like Mike referred to. The fact that we have six counselors is so we can all debate these issues, all have our varying opinions, and then come to a consensus. And so I think the council, as usual, will meet with the question that you put before us. So I'm guilty. 
of doing something, and I do it on purpose. Even if I agree with an issue that we're discussing, and there doesn't seem to be enough to see the op opposite, just to see the, the validation as to why it's a good decision. And because I want all the other counselors, I don't want to be the only one speaking. I want the other, ones, the other counselors to say, well, this is my opinion, and this is why. So usually if it's something that I'm going forward and I want to see it happen, I don't say the first thing. But if nobody says the first thing, I say the, the opposing discussion. Because I like to see where, the, where their thoughts are. You know, Mike and I have a lot of arguments on the council. Uh, <laughs> maybe because we sit next to each other, I'm not sure. But, uh, but you know, he's changed my mind on a few, on a few things and opened my eyes, and, and I believe I've opened his eyes on a, on a few things. Um, we, we've got to have that balance, that counteracting balance, really. Um, if everybody goes up there and we just vote yes, 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 yes to everything that's on that agenda, we're not doing right by you. We are, we are doing you a disservice because we didn't actually discuss why this is impactful to our citizenry, why this is impactful to our future. Um, and we have to have those discussions, even if we're there till 10 o'clock at night. I say 11, but uh, all, the, uh, all the older gentlemen and ladies, uh, uh, I'll wait. I agree. I, I, so our council that we have right now, we do argue. And I mean, sometimes I want to throw something at Daniel, but I don't. But um, Mike brings up great points, and Ray, and Bobby, and Kathy, and we all come from different facets of life. And so we all bring in different points of view. And when I didn't know the answer for VFW, it's because I rely on him. If it's construction, I'm like, Daniel's going to be able to help me understand what's going on. And so it's, it's a learning community, and it's, I think we, are, we value each other and we respect each other, and we do. We listen to each other, and it's like, hmm, let me think about that. Okay, you just changed my mind. So I think we get along really well um, for the most part, and I think you have to have the diversity with respect and the ability to change your mind and not just be stuck on this is my point of view and this is what I believe and I'm going to die on this hill because we're all here to work for what's best for our city and what's best for our citizens. I know that the BSU game starts here in a few minutes and everybody wants to get to that but I have two questions left and then we'll be done. Uh, we'll start with you, Mike. If you received a million dollar grant for the city and you could use it any way you wanted to do, what would be your first priority and why? Can we bump that to 10 million? <laughs> what? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I, a um, million dollars is all you get. Okay. Yeah. A million doesn't go very it far. Doesn't, no. uh, so you have to pick something that's a priority there. I, I would, because of my, uh, my friend Ray over there is uh, you know, working on the downtown, and I realize that everybody's not on the same page for the downtown, but I think we can all agree that something needs to be done to uh, spruce up downtown. Well, you know, whatever that is. If it's just new sidewalks, if it's, uh, you know, leveling out the streets, some of those streets down there have been overlaid so much that it's uh, like walking downhill to get to the sidewalk. And so if I had a million dollars, even though in the real world, I, I, I understand that's not going to do much downtown. I would probably, uh, I think my biggest bang for the buck would be doing something downtown with it. So I would focus on Kiwanis Park, our pool, a walking path around with exercise equipment that is out there year round, like AARP donated some to, or gave a grant to Nampera Caldwell, things that can build our, bring our families in, so more places to sit, more things for our families to do down at Kiwanis Park, because it's beautiful down there, you know, and we could turn it into, um, with a little river going through there, we could do something like they have in Caldwell with the river, and it, we, we could just do so much. A million would not be enough, but I would love to see our pool, our pool resurfaced and redone, because that's, that's a gem for our community. And we have people from all over the area that come to Payette to use our pool. And it, it's safety, because how are our kids gonna learn to swim? It's not in a bathtub, they need a pool. 
So I would I would focus on Kiwanis Park, I think, and just really pour some money into improving it and making it nicer. So we did a walk through the pool a month or so ago, and uh, and it's in pretty bad disrepair. It's been neglected for a lot of years, and uh, so my suggestion was we have three hundred about three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars left over bar money, fix three fifty, maybe it's two fifty. Um, that we just take that and put it into the pool. Now, if I had that magical million, I'd take that million and dump it in the pool, and the pool would take every dime to to make that facility. Um, Great again, as Trump would say. Because, uh, I mean, when I was a kid, it was a good, clean facility. And uh, it's just degraded over time. It's been, it's been neglected a little bit over time. And through budget times, the pool's always the first one. Uh, well, roads are the first ones to get cut, and then the pool's the second one to get cut. So I'd take that million and put it in the pool and make it a great facility that, uh, that the, this community can be proud of, proud of having. Because if we don't take care of it, it's going to go away. And I don't want to see that, because it is a, a good resource we have. And uh, we already have the slate, and we just got to make it pretty. Well, we just had a long discussion about how the council needs to disagree on things. I put it in the pool. <laughs> um, we, we need more things for our kids. Um, if we don't have things for our kids to do that are healthy, they'll do things that are unhealthy. And that's the truth. We, we need to do more things that our kids can focus on, our families can focus on, and have an enjoyable time in the community. So I can't say much more about the pool. I think the pool is the right place to put it. Does anybody else have a question that they didn't get to me yet? Okay, this is your last question. These people have showed up tonight. Convince them that you're the one to either be reelected or elected for the city council vote on Tuesday. Mike, we'll start with you. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you were looking this way. So. <laughs> well, I was reminding myself to uh, thank you for doing this uh, and thank everybody for coming out on a, a Saturday, rainy Saturday evening. Uh, I, I, wish, I wish everybody in here would come to a city council meeting occasionally, and I don't think I would have to convince you to vote for me on Tuesday. I think you would, uh, I think you would watch the way that I do business at a city council meeting. You would appreciate that I have the ideals of an Idahoan uh, when I make my decisions. Uh, I think you would appreciate that I always try to do and I say this when I make a decision. I'm trying to do what I believe is best for Ed. Now, sometimes it's difficult because it's just me making the decision. I don't get a lot of input on some things, so I do what I think is best. I, I do what I think uh, people who have lived their entire life in Idaho would want me to do, and that's how I vote on things. Thank you. I also want to thank you all for coming out. I, I want to be watching the BSU football game, so thank you for being here. Uh, I want you to reelect me because I think I've been doing a lot of great things to help improve communication, to help improve transparency. When a project is put forth and we're like assigned, okay, I want you to look through chapter 12 of code and bring it back to us. I'm the one, I, I get that done. So if I'm assigned something, I get it done. And I'm also someone that is approachable, that people call me out of the blue and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I don't know them, but I listen to them. And just like Donna's question, I am going to find that out and get back to you, I promise. Um, and so, I want to continue serving you and because I think I'm doing a good job and I think my voice is important to be heard on the council. So I would ask for your vote on Tuesday. Thank you. I am nothing if not consistent. I represent uh, the citizens uh, with, my, with my beliefs and what I've been, been given feedback from my constituents. Um, you know, going into this, the pool was never my number one priority. And 
what happened was I had a, many constituents come up to me and say, hey, that pool's important to us. And I don't have little kids, you know, we, we don't have little kids. I have nieces and nephews that are now all over 18, so the pool is not a, not a personal game for me, but it's what the citizen, citizenry wants. And uh, I've never had somebody tell me to close the pool. So consistently, we fight to make the pool better. We, we fight to get the assets allocated, and we fight to be fiscally conservative. Um, I've said this in many council meetings. There's been too, it's been too long to where we kept taxes too low, in my opinion, and it's time to start fixing the things that are dilapidating. And, and things are dilapidating beneath our feet every day. And like Mike said, there's pipes in the ground that are 100 years old, 100 years old and that's true. Uh, so if you like me, I'm going to continue to fight the good fight to, to continue to better the community, continue to better, better the infrastructure, and continue to be fiscally conservative and allocate that money directly to where it needs to be spent, spent not just an, an open budget to where, where the executive branch gets to do whatever they want. We have a legislative branch for a reason. We're there to allocate the money. And uh, that's the decisions that I, that I hold, hold high in my, in my perspective that's important. We have to have a fiscally conservative budget and uh, spend it wisely. And so if you like me, I'm going to continue to forge that path. Well, like I mentioned before, I used to be a city councilman and I used to be a mayor. And so I have the experience from both sides of that road, and I'm sure Craig will probably attest to the fact they're different roads. Um, that experience and being able also to have a decade and a half to reflect on that period of my life and I think I did a good job but I also know there's things I could do better there's no doubt in my mind there's things I could do better and that's what I'll do I want you to give me the opportunity to take those reflections and that experience and do the job even better than I did last time and I will guarantee you, I will do everything in my power to do that. And I will guarantee you, I will communicate with you while I do it. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming tonight. I appreciate it. I know it's a Saturday night. The game's probably, they're probably late on their kickoff anyway, so they're going to be fine. Probably. So let's give these guys a round of applause. Since everybody's here, I want to tell everybody you talked about town hall meetings and stuff on November 13th, Monday at 6 o'clock. We are having a town hall and a, and a public hearing on downtown. We're looking at a grant to try to start in the middle of town at the park. And so we need people there because there's a guy from the state's going to come in and helping us with this grant. Uh, and it's a starting point. It's an expensive project. We've got to start somewhere. So that's 6 o'clock at the Senior Center, town hall, public hearing at Get everybody there that can come. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Ray.